Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Welcome to Liberty Me You. Uh, we're here tonight with Sheldon Richmond for the second uh, installment of his uh, series on the American founding. If you missed last week, uh, we're going, going to have the video of that up within the next couple of days on the website. And be sure to check that out because it was a really, really excellent talk. It's, I think it's one of the best we've had here at Liberty Me You. Tonight, he's going to be talking on the topic of empire on their minds, kind of the birth of kind of the, uh, the libido dominandi, the uh, birth of the, how the American empire really got its, uh, its start and its, I uh, don't want to say birth again, uh, bad with words today, come on. Um, so in, if you're not aware, which I don't know how you uh, wouldn't be, Sheldon Richmond is of course, a mainstay of the libertarian movement. He's the vice president of the Future of Freedom Foundation and the editor of their monthly journal, The Future of Freedom. He's the former editor of uh, the Foundation for Economic Education's publication, The Freeman, and the author of uh, several great books, including uh, Separating School and State, How to Liberate America's Families, uh, why, uh, your Money or Your Life, Why We Must Abolish the Income Tax, and Tethered Citizens, Time to Repeal the Welfare State. Uh, and he is an amazing speaker and writer, and definitely check him out elsewhere uh, if you haven't already. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sheldon. At, uh, and good evening, everyone. That was a, that was a very nice introduction. Uh, being the uh, sort of uh, disputatious person I am, I'm, I almost feel compelled to... Uh, to offer a rebuttal, but uh, I won't do that since the time is limited. Uh, so the topic tonight is empire, and it, it is building on last week's. So the, the, it doesn't mean you have to have heard last week's. Although if you have, you didn't. If you didn't at the time, I hope you'll you'll come back to liberty.me and uh, and check it out once it's posted, which should be soon. Uh, but it does follow on from that. Uh, I, t I talked about. Uh, the, the transition from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution with some background of, uh, regarding the revolution and what was going on there and what the various struggles were. <clears throat> and I think this um, <clears throat> this flows right out of it. <clears throat> now, I want to start in the current context talking about empire before I leap back uh, to an earlier point in uh, in U.S. history. Just, uh, I, I think that's a useful way to get started. <clears throat> and, and I can turn to the uh, conflict in Ukraine, which which has uh, uh, all kinds of interesting uh, considerations in light of the t t tonight's topic. So, you know, if you if you cover if you watch most of the coverage of uh, of, of that uh, uh, conflict that's going on and some terrible things have truly happened there, uh, you would think if you watch the American coverage, especially, you would think that uh, the only uh, one of the parties to this uh, conflict that uh, empire would have anything uh, would have any relevance is is, the, is Russia okay Russia is trying to reconstitute the old Russian Empire or the Soviet Empire uh, this is the kind of commentary we we uh, hear every day and the news is pretty much cast in that way the US is is being seen as sort of a, a good faith uh, bystander uh, maybe you know helping uh, uh, on the side of uh, justice and uh, but otherwise uh, has entirely good intentions and, you know, nothing to, nothing to look at here. Please move along. Um, but this conflict has prompted uh, several level, what I would regard as level-headed commentators uh, to point out that uh, of, all of all governments in the world, the U.S. government is in no position to lecture uh, Russia about respecting other nations' borders. In other words, not acting like an empire or a, a, an aspiring empire. Uh, when uh, Secretary of State Curry said uh, back in the beginning of all this uh, on Meet the Press, uh, "quote This is an this is about uh, Crimea. This is an act of aggression that is completely trumped up in terms of its pretext. You don't invade another country on phony pretext in order to assert your interests." Uh, one of the commentators I refer to, uh, who, uh, Ivan Eland at the Independent Institute, responded, "Hmm, what about?" Uh, the George W. Uh, George W. Uh, Bush's invasion of Iraq after exaggerating threats from uh, Iraqi we weapons of mass destruction and dreaming up a non-existent operational link between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and the 9-11 attacks. What about Ronald Reagan's invasion of Grenada in 1983? 
uh, to save U.S. medical students in no danger, and George H.W. Bush's invasion of Panama because its leader, Manuel Doriega, was associated with the narcotics trade. More generally, Latin America has been a sphere of inf influence and playground uh, for U.S. invasions since the uh, 1990s. Lyndon Johnson's invasion of the Dominican Republic in 1965 and Bill Clinton's threatened invasion of Haiti in 1994 being two recent examples. Indeed, Russia uh, isn't the only uh, country that has uh, regarded its backyard, if we can use that phrase, as its uh, sphere of influence and, and, and its, its playground. Uh, this doesn't make it, make it okay for uh, what the Russians uh, have done, and, I'm not, and, and I don't mean to imply any defense of Russia. I'm just trying to put this in context. But as uh, Adam uh, Gopnik observes, uh, who's, who's a writer, I believe he wrote this in the, uh, oh gosh, New Yorker, I forget offhand now. Uh, quote, Russia, as ugly, provocative, and deserving of condemn condemnation as its acts in Crimea may be, seems to be behaving as Russia has always behaved, even long before the Bolsheviks arrived. Indeed, Russia is behaving as every regional power in the history of human relations has always behaved maximizing it, its influence over its neighbors, in this case a neighbor with a large chunk of ethnic countrymen. So notice that uh, Gopnik said every regional power in the history of human relations has always behaved. I take that to include the United States, and I think Gopnik uh, is uh, accurate about that. Now, Eland only scratches the surface in mentioning the U.S. government's unceasing program to control events in its sphere of influence. Uh, some people understand that this, that this uh, program preceded the 20th century. It did not begin, as so many people think, with the end of the Cold War at the, uh, when World War II ended. Uh, now, some people will take it back to the Spanish-American War, which uh, is widely regarded as having been an imperialistic uh, uh, move by the United States to become a Pacific uh, power when it went to war against Spain over the Philippines. Uh, and, and ruled the Philippines and, and put down a put down a, a, an insurrection in the, around 1900. Um, but that 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 war, uh, I'm thinking further back than that war. Some people don't take it any further back than that. I want to go back even further. So how far back? I want to go back roughly to 1776, just to pick a uh, a date that stands out in most people's uh, minds. Even the government schools teach, or at least uh, taught during my 12 year sentence in them that America's founders had, let us say, an expansive vision for the country that they were establishing. Uh, historian uh, William Appleman Williams, uh, in his essay, Empire as a Way of Life, provides uh, many details, a book, I, by the way, I recommend. Uh, clearly, these men, the founders, had empire on their minds. Uh, before he became an evangelical uh, for independence from Great Britain, Benjamin Franklin proposed a partnership between England and the American colonists to help spread the enlightened empire throughout the Americas. So here he was working on behalf of the British Empire and offering to uh, engineer a partnership uh, in which uh, Britain would take over all of Canada. This is before, before 1776. This is earlier. Uh, and, uh, and basically, with America as sort of the local proxy uh, ruling the whole uh, hemisphere. Uh, the British rejected the proposal. They thought it was impractical. So at that point, uh, Franklin turns to independence. He embraces the cause, uh, but without giving up the dream of empire in the new world. George Washington similarly spoke of the rising American empire and described himself as living in an infant empire. Uh, Hamilton, uh, Alexander Hamilton spoke in, in similar terms. Thomas Jefferson, whom the uh, great um, uh, historian of this period, Gordon Wood, describes as the most expansion-minded president in history, uh, set out a vision for what he called, quote, an empire of liberty, which he later revised to an empire for liberty when the Native Americans proved unenthusiastic about being ruled by the former colonists. Uh, when Jefferson left the presidency, he, he claimed that no constitution, quote, no constitution was ever before as well calculated as ours for extensive empire and self-government. Uh, I'll leave it to you to sort those two things out. This is a, t a tension which I'll uh, a little have a little more to say about as we go along. Uh, as Jefferson wrote James Monroe in 1801, which was Jefferson's first year as president, 
Uh, however, our present interests may restrain us within our, li our own limits. It is impossible not to look forward to distant times when our rapid multiplication will expand beyond those limits and cover the whole northern, if not the southern continent, with people speaking the same language, governed in similar forms and by similar lo laws. So he clearly had a, uh, uh, at least a hemispheric uh, empire on, in his mind. W uh, William Appleton Williams notes, quote, Jefferson's proposal, uh, Jefferson had a proposal to have the great seal of the United States depict the children of Israel being guided by a pillar of light. This is the secularist, the deist uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and to Jefferson, America was, in his own words, the chosen nation. This was not an uncommon attitude. Uh, indeed, in the eyes of the founders, the American Revolution, I think it's fair to say, was largely a war between a mature empire, em, uh, uh, namely Britain, and a rising one, or a nascent one, namely the soon-to-be United States. Uh, so it wasn't so much that the American, that the leading uh, Americans, I'm not speaking necessarily for the mass of the people, there were lots of different opinions, of course, and different ways of looking at things, but as far as the, the, the what we call the, the founders, the top sort of elite, uh, they were not so much rebelling against the idea of empire. They were rebelling against the British Empire, but not the very idea of empire, since they essentially uh, sought to um, replace it, certainly in the, in the uh, New World. <clears throat> so the goal was to bring civilization, which was still identified with England and its institutions, to the New World's benighted. Uh, How, how lucky uh, they were to become. Uh, the, 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 the benighted didn't always appreciate how lucky they were that the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, European Enlightenment was, uh, was on the way, being carried to them by the, by the Americans. As Jefferson indicated, uh, this vision was more than continental because South America was never regarded as uh, permanently off limits. If, uh, if expansion in the future required uh, conflict with the French and, and the Spanish, so be it, as far as they were concerned. The only debate, really, at this point, at that point, for them was uh, was when expansion would be feasible. Some were more aware of the uh, current limits on them, you know, the, the limits to them at that time, uh, and, and the limits were more uh, uh, apparent to some than others. Others wanted to go for more. Others, uh, some thought that. Uh, the, we, they could wait, they, and if they waited long enough, they felt that the, the uh, territories that they wanted to ultimately control would sort of fall into their, their hands like ripe fruit and avoid war. I mean, if war could be avoided, they, uh, they, were, they were happy to, to do that, and they assumed that time was on their side, that the old, the old imperial powers, Spain, France, England, others, would, uh, would get tired and, and go away, and that would leave uh, the Americans to... Uh, to rule the, uh, the, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but they still had the continent, of course, uh, the, at least the, 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 the continent, the part of the continent between Mexico and, uh, and uh, Canada to, uh, to conquer. So that was really the first order of business. The, Indor the Indian Wars were among the first steps in this empire building. The uns and, you know, this was, uh, this was a sign of what was to come, the unspeakable brutality and duplicity, the Acts of ethnic cleansing and genocide, as we say today, were crimes not merely against individuals, but against whole societies and nations. Uh, imperialism was not yet a word in use, but that's what this was, as were the designs and moves on Canada, uh, one of the objects of, uh, objects of James Madison's uh, War of 1812. And there were, there were more than once uh, did uh, the U.S. make moves on Canada, uh, although obviously unsuccessfully. But also, uh, there were moves on Mexico, Cuba, the, the, uh, some of these successful, some not. The Floridas, uh, which was more than just the state of Florida. The uh, Mississippi and or uh, New Orleans, the vast Louisiana Territory, which uh, Jefferson acquired, uh, and as, as he understood it, unconstitutionally. Uh, the Northwest Territory uh, and uh, the Pacific Coast, which they saw as the gateway to Asia. 
this was all, they saw this as a, sort of uh, being guided by divine providence. Even, even Jefferson, again, the secularist, still could talk in terms of this being ordained. <clears throat> uh, it was just a natural thing that, the, uh, that these, this, this elite should move the nation westward, and once it got to the Pacific and controlled the ports there, that was then opening Asia, and they had, they, you know, they had in mind the Hawaii and China. They even spoke of China. Now, I'm not saying uh, conquer China, but to be the dominant influence and power uh, there. <clears throat> uh, so, in light of all this, uh, well, hang on. The, the the one thing I need to point out is the wishes of the inhabitants, like like in the larger Louisiana Territory, which is a very large territory. It's like 286,000 square miles. Uh, and uh, if you, you add to that the uh, the uh, territory obtained by the in the in the uh, treaty uh, negotiated by John Quincy Adams, uh, which takes them all the way into the Northwest and the Pacific Coast. Uh, you're talking about a lot of t territory. You're talking about the bulk of the of uh, this part of the continent of uh, North America. Uh, the wishes of the inhabitants of these territories, who, as Jefferson put it, uh, speaking of the Louisiana residents, were yet incapable of self-government, or as incapable as children, he said. Uh, the, their, their wishes just did not count. They were going to be, come under the domain of the, of the new United States, uh, regardless of any uh, wish they, they had in the matter. They certainly weren't going to be consulted. So this is a story we see over and over again that imperial powers uh, 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 perpetrate on people. Uh, by the way, once we see this, we can understand that Lincoln's war many years later, was, a, was an exercise in empire preservation. This is one reason he felt he could not let the Union uh, break apart. It was ordained, after all, that this be a, uh, the Union, and he was not going to preside over, uh, over its, uh, uh, you know, its uh, crack-up. Now, a good deal of this program was tied up with trade. Trade, of course, is very, very important. For libertarians, uh, trade far and wide is a good thing. I mean, we, we like the idea of worldwide trade, but one must keep in mind that the expansion of trade in those days, and for many people in these days, uh, depended on how strong the government was. By hook and crook, a constitution that denied the national government the powers to regulate trade at the tax, I'm speaking here of the Articles of Confederation, which I uh, talked about last week, uh, that constitution had been exchanged for one, namely the U.S. Constitution, that authorized both powers, the power to tax and the power to regulate trade. Uh, uh, the libertarian novel Jay Nock, as I discussed last week, called this uh, trade of uh, one constitution for the other, uh, the coup d'etat of Philadelphia, named, uh, referring the, to the federal convention in Philadelphia. So trade to the, those folks meant trade policy. In other words, government in the leadership role, government activism. And that included selective embargoes, such as those imposed by uh, Jefferson's program of what he called peaceful coercion. Uh, virtually, no, virtually no one back then envisioned trade as occurring apart from government expansion and protection. And so in other words, when they talked about trade and the importance of trade, they didn't mean uh, laissez-faire. They didn't mean government, leave us alone. We uh, traders and merchants and entrepreneurs will, will uh, you know, on our own uh, through voluntary exchange, uh, tried to trade with the rest of the world. They, it, the idea was it, it was assumed that government would be the spearhead, opening markets. And we see this all through the 19th century and through the 20th century and to this day, right? Trade, it's considered a free trade policy for the president to be the, uh, negotiating bilateral, multilateral trade agreements uh, with other countries. So Americans had yet to learn the wisdom later spoken by the, Engl the great English free trader, and peace activist Richard Cobden, who said, this is one of my favorite quotations, those who propose to influence by force the traffic of the world, the trade in other words, forget that affairs of trade, like matters of conscience, change the very nature if touched by the hand of violence. For as faith, if forced, would no longer be religion but hypocrisy, so commerce becomes robbery if coerced by warlike uh, armaments. Uh, they would have laughed at Cobden back then. And it's true that uh, that uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was pretty much fresh off the press in the time I'm talking about, right? It was published in 1776. 
but I don't see evidence that many people were reading uh, the Wealth of Nations. Uh, perhaps uh, Jefferson did, but I don't. You don't see it reflected in uh, in uh, certainly the major thinkers and the major uh, uh, politicians, the statesmen, whatever you want to call them, uh, because they don't seem to be taking uh, Smith's advice. There's no, there's no sense of laissez-faire there, uh, if we want to interpret uh, Smith as being laissez-faire in terms of world trade, which he certainly uh, seems to be, uh, at least relatively so. Uh, so, uh, as I spelled out in greater detail last week, the Articles of Confederation were a poor platform for empire building, but not so the Constitution. Uh, both, uh, as William, uh, William Appman Williams put it, both in the mind of Madison and in its nature, the Constitution was an instrument of imperial government at home and abroad. So I think we can really locate the roots of American uh, empire in Philadelphia in 1787 during the, the Federal Convention. I think it would have been hard for them to pull this off uh, uh, just under the meager powers of the uh, uh, of the Articles of Confederation. <clears throat> now, I don't mean to say that uh, the liberty of Americans, certainly in the 13 states, was of no concern uh, to these uh, men I'm speaking of, uh, but I do mean that liberty was to be subordinated only to the extent necessary, of course, to, the, to national greatness, to the national greatness that was America's destiny. Uh, the, the term manifest destiny comes along a little bit later, uh, but it's, they clearly have this idea in mind. This is something that was fated, F-A-T-E-D, fated, and um, they were not going to let anything stand in the way. Uh, now, Americans sense that something exceptional was happening. In, in the formation of the United States and the developments uh, right afterwards. And indeed it was, as Gordon Wood explains in his masterful book, The Radicalism, the Radicalism of the American Revolution, highly recommended, uh, to the dismay of the dominant Federalists, average Americans exemplified by uh, those whom Wood calls the plebeian anti-Federalists, uh, saw the revolution as having a overturned the hierarchy and aristocratic society, colonial society, in favor of, of a democracy that facilitated personal and commercial self-interest. Uh, that, that's what uh, Wood thinks is the, really the radicalism and exceptionalism of, uh, of, the, of the American Revolution, and the, the, uh, the intellectual revolution that occurred up to the, up to the actual uh, military revolution. Um, but this attitude, this idea of personal and commercial self-interest, without aristocracy, did not sit well uh, with, with those who wanted America to be, as Wood put it, either a hierarchy of ranks or a homogeneous Republican whole. Now, the Federalists tended to uh, be more aristocratic. They saw things in terms of social hierarchy. The Republicans, the, like the Jeffersonians, uh, were uh, generally anti-aristocratic, but they still saw the Republic in sort of civic republican terms, in other words, a homogeneous whole. They, they didn't, the idea that everybody, everybody off of, uh, minding, simply tending to their own business and trying to prosper was not what the, uh, the republicans uh, tended to have in mind. And so Wood makes a point that when the, uh, as the founding fathers uh, began to die off, not one of them died happy. They all were unhappy with how the country turned out uh, because they saw too many people just running around just trying to make money and do better for themselves. <clears throat> now, this, let's get back to this idea of exceptionalism. It's very important. Um, even a well-grounded exceptionalism, and there were, like I said, there were grounds for uh, seeing what was going on in the United States in those early days as exceptional, historically. But even well-grounded exceptionalism can turn dark by the perceived duty to enlighten, or if they prove recalcitrant, exterminate the benighted. And that's what happened. The Indian Wars were very popular with the American people. For one thing, they wanted to spread out into the land that the Indians uh, were already occupying. And so they didn't mind if the army came along and moved them out of the way. And so were the other uh, imperial exploits. doesn't mean there were no dissenters, but generally this found favor with the American people. Uh, William Appleman Williams notes that uh, with exceptionalism came a feeling of loneliness, isolation, and insecurity. After all, if you're exceptional, if you're the only one, if your small group of, uh, of 13 states 
are sort of alone in the world, and uh, you, you're trying something brand new, you're go you may well feel that others are looking at you and uh, thinking you're the weird one, and stay away from us, and uh, we, you know keep your ideas to yourself. And so this can engender a, f uh, a fear for your own security that others are looking at you and uh, maybe wanting to quash you. And of course, uh, there was there was certainly concern in Europe about uh, 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 revolutions being uh, being spread. Certainly, once the French Revolution came along, there was a there was some fear among the old, of course, the old regimes, the old monarchs, that uh, this revolutionary idea was going to catch on like fire and what was going to happen. So there was concern. <clears throat> so in the United States. Uh, don't forget, colonial powers were still in the U.S., uh, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere, not in the U.S. itself, but in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, south and north of, of, uh, of the new country. Uh, there were, the, the quest for security and tranquility for this new nation, and they used both words, uh, fueled these imperial exploits. There was a sense that we have to uh, have influence or control over... Uh, the, the territories of the new world that are outside of the country in order to uh, secure ourselves. We don't want uh, hostile nations uh, with hostile systems, you know, uh, non-Republican systems, uh, controlling those territories and then surrounding us and uh, maybe threatening us. So they saw it uh, not only bringing enlightenment to the, to the others, but for, for their own uh, security and tranquility. And they talked uh, often in those terms. So, as we can see, the national security state is really nothing new. I think we can see the buds of a national security state there. The technology was certainly primitive compared to what we have today. But the, atti the attitudes were not, not uh, so very different. Some American figures glimpsed that empire and liberty might not uh, fit so easily together. Uh, the, the unabashed empire builders were convinced uh, you know, in contrast to these ones that are, were a little uh, concerned, that freedom at home required empire. But like I say, there were some who realized there was some tension between empire and domestic liberty. Uh, now, that's, that's a sophisticated point because, you know, England, of course, was, Great Britain was an empire, but domestically, the, the uh, English were relatively free for the time and then don't forget the americans original complaint was that the their their rights of english uh, as englishmen were being uh, uh violated they would have been very happy to have the rights of the, the same rights as uh, as englishmen they just felt as as colonists they were being treated in an inferior way they didn't have representation in the parliament but they were at one point satisfied with the rights of englishmen which were not insubstantial uh there was magna carta there were other things uh uh, habeas corpus, uh, the castle doctrine, a man's home is his castle. Those things all evolved in England, and, and the Americans before before independence were very proud of those things. <clears throat> uh, so that makes it look on the face that you could have an empire with a good deal of domestic uh, uh, liberty. Question is how how long that would last, but uh, this was on people's minds. Uh, the problem was that uh, even many who um, opposed empire, who were uncomfortable with the idea of empire. Uh, and spoke and spoke against it eloquently. Still wanted ends that only an empire could pro pro procure. And here I'm thinking of trade again. If you want the government to open markets for your uh, your home merchants, that's going to require a government with a global reach and imperial powers. And uh, and so um, there was a tension even within the ones even within the thinkers who were concerned about empire because they wanted things that imperial means uh, were best suited to achieve. Uh, William Appen and Williams uh, 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 puts uh, John Quincy Adams in this small group of people who were had concerns about empire. Now, Adams was a, a, a big expansionist when it came to, uh, to this continent, the North American continent, but he had other concerns about going beyond that. Uh, and of course, um, Adams is famous for his July 4th, 1821 speech where he declared that America goes not abroad in search of monsters uh, to destroy. Williams calls this thoughtful, powerful, and subversive uh, even. Uh, but Williams adds, but for, a time, for, for the time, Adams remained enfolded in the spirit of empire and was a, unable to control the urge to extend America's power and influence. And I, like I said, as Secretary of State under under uh, James Monroe, he negotiated a big uh, 
uh, treaty, uh, transcontinental treaty with the uh, with the Spanish, acquiring Florida and a great deal of other territory. Uh, he also favored a, a acquisition of Texas uh, for a time until the until the slave issue then entered in, and when he was concerned that it would become a slave state, then he opposed it. So this is a, as usual. Things are complicated, and people who were pro expansion could then pull back from that position if they thought expansion was going to aid uh, the slave, uh, the slave power, uh, and, and so there are always many things going on. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of Adams as Secretary of State, he supported uh, Andrew Jackson's seizure of Florida from the Spanish, and there was also suppression of Indians in that, and Adams uh, applauded it. Uh, Adams uh, was the main author of the of the Monroe Doctrine. He was Monroe's Secretary of State, which announced uh, not only that the United States would stand aloof from Europe's quarrels, but also, but also, and, and importantly, this sometimes gets overlooked, that the Western Hemisphere was exclusively the U.S. government's sphere of influence, uh, the whole Western Hemisphere. As it as it said, the American continents, continents plural by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European governments. Uh, for any uh, such extension would uh, be taken as, quote, dangerous to our peace and safety. Our peace and safety. In other words, our national security. Not, they weren't concerned about the people maybe of South America, of Mexico, of Cuba, uh, of the islands off, uh, off of, uh, you know, in the Caribbean. Uh, it wasn't their liberty was not the issue here. The issue was uh, we didn't want the European powers here; they were a threat to us. <clears throat> so keep out of our backyard, Europe, and we'll keep out of uh, yours. Of course, the young United States did not have the resources to concern itself with Europe. Uh, when in the uh, 1830s, I think it was, when there was a revolution going on in uh, in uh, Greece, there were members of Congress who, who who wanted the U.S. to send an envoy there and sort of in insert itself in that in, in, into that uh, uh, conflict. Uh, luckily, Monroe and Adams were not uh, uh, crazy about doing that. They never, Monroe never appointed the envoy. But there were people that thought that would be, would be perfectly proper, uh, even after the uh, Monroe Doctrine had been uh, promulgated. Now, to wrap this up, in, in the book, A Dangerous Nation, the neoconservative thinker Robert Kagan acknowledges that America's ruling elite always aspired to empire, and it began the pro and that it began the project even before the country was independent from Great Britain. Kagan, of course, as a neocon, wants uh, Americans to understand uh, the history I've described so that they may feel comfortable as citizens uh, of a world empire. Uh, he's convinced that Americans, uh, don't, you know, don't realize understand America as, uh, that America was, has long been an empire and therefore is uh, uncomfortable. My purpose, of course, is uh, is, uh, is is different. Uh, I, w I want them to know America was an empire so that we can ch see that it's wrong and change it. Uh, Kagan says they just don't know the history. So let me uh, uh, close with a quote from, uh, from Kagan, which I think is, is pretty accurate. He says, the gap between Americans' self-perception and the perceptions of others has endured throughout the nation's history. Americans have cherished an image of themselves as by nature inward-looking and aloof, only sporadically and, sp and spasmodically venturing forth into the world, usually in response uh, to external attack or perceived threats. Don't forget, after all, Americans think that the, uh, uh, the United States uh, was, was isolate, quote, isolationist before Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor uh, which of course was not true. Uh, this image survives, Kagan continues, despite 400 years, and I draw attention now to his time frame here, despite 400 years of steady expansion and an ever-deepening involvement in world affairs, and despite innumerable wars, interventions, and prolonged occupations in foreign lands. It is as if uh, it were all an accident or odd twist of fate. Even as the United States has risen to a position of glo global hegemony, expanding its reach and purview and involvement across the co continent and then across the oceans, Americans still believe their nation's natural tendencies or toward passivity, indifference, and insularity. Close quote. Of course, Kagan's book is is, a, is an attempt to uh, correct the record, show Americans that that's not true, that it's not a history of passivity, indifference, and insularity. Contrary to Kagan, libertarians have an interest in knowing this history and teaching it to others 
precisely so that we can work to dismantle the empire. At least that's my view. Why is that? Because, as we are witnessing today, liberty is in constant jeopardy when the state's uh, highest priorities are national security and global hegemony. So, let's open up for uh, questions, conversation, comments. I hope I've been provocative. Uh, very provocative. It's uh, some stuff I've never heard before, even in libertarian circles. Our first question here is from Tiffany Madison. She says, uh, three constitutionalists watched your lecture with me. Josh asks, do you think Jefferson had any good intentions, or was he just an opportunist? Uh, hello, Tiffany. Uh, well, those kind of questions are very difficult to answer, uh, right? I mean, do I have to? I have to psychoanalyze him, or, or I, you know, obviously, I, I don't know him. How do you answer a question about a person you don't know personally? Uh, Jefferson is a very complex uh, figure, very fascinating, interesting figure. He he obviously said some good things. Uh, he also said some bad things. His position on the Constitution seemed to waffle over the years. Uh, at one point, he seemed uh, very critical of the Constitution, and then, like I said, when he was leaving office, he said it was a perfect document for expanding an expanding empire and self-government. So he's a very difficult per person to figure out. Uh, that's one reason there's so many books about him versus maybe other people, because he's uh, he's so enigmatic. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm going to have to kind of duck that per uh, duck that. Uh, 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 duck the question uh, because I, you know it's just uh, it's too hard to know. I mean, I don't like to ascribe just uniformly bad motives to people. I try to I try to see things the way they see it and and uh, put the best uh, interpretation on it. I think that's the rule of charity. Uh, but of course, he says some things that that uh, about, uh, for example, the Indians. That um, I mean, he was one of those people who uh, he was actually sort of a soft racist. I mean, there was certainly a racial thing with the Indians. It wasn't just that they were on land that the Americans wanted to get their hands on, uh, that the non-Native Americans wanted to get their hands on. Uh, uh, there was also a racial element. And Jefferson was actually uh, more kindly toward them uh, and, and felt perhaps they could be assimilated and brought in. Uh, that, that was sort of the, the softer side. There were other people who, who thought, uh, no, that was useless. Uh, uh, slaughter was really the only solution. So I'll have to leave it at that. He's a very complex person. I remember last week we talked a little bit about the tendency of some libertarians to kind of romanticize the Articles of Confederation or the Constitution or, you know, various things in in history. I think there's that same kind of tendency with uh, some of the, the founders like Jefferson. People want something that they relate to, I guess, uh, someone that they can latch on to and say, oh, there's our tradition. Um, Natasha Petrova asks, when you said, say uh, England had a great deal of freedom, are you factoring in the class system? Well, I was ha hello, uh, Natasha. I was uh, I was speaking in relative terms. I I, I didn't uh, flesh that out and put it in full context. Uh, sure, it's a very rigid class system, but 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 as uh, Wood brings out in his book on the, on the radicalism of the American Revolution, uh, while while he thinks. Uh, uh, the revolution was unique in the United States because of this anti-aristocratic, anti, really anti-class feeling. Um, he, he says the roots of that also were in England, and even people in the lower classes did not res respect the, uh, you know, the uh, the, the higher uh, the, the higher ranking uh, classes uh, the way they were supposed to. There was a lot of, uh, you know, it makes me think a little bit of what what um, Thaddeus Russell has to. Say say about Americans in his renegade history of the United States. There was there was this defiant attitude, according to Wood, even among English Englishmen uh, who, who were of the of the so called lower uh, ranks. So uh, and and there and I believe they still had a good deal of rights. They, were, they just had inherited a good uh, a good a good deal of um, uh, protection. It wasn't anything like libertarians would want, but the, but the idea that the king couldn't cross the threshold of a of a person's home uh, and I should say a man's home because women obviously didn't have anything like the rights that even the common men had. Um, that applied even, I think, to generally to the to uh, you know, like I say, the common man. Uh, that uh, there were, you know, this was the beginning of the need for warrants and stuff like that. I mean, the, we do see the the, the beginnings of that. So uh, even taking in a, into account this this class system, uh, 
uh, I think there's still something to be said there. I mean, liberty grew haltingly and slowly and imperfectly. Uh, it's like sort of uh, uh, green shoots uh, coming up between the cracks in, si in the sidewalk. But they, you know, they'll still find those openings and and, uh, and come out. That's uh, really interesting. Uh, speaking of Thaddeus Russell, he's going to be here uh, giving a talk on renegade history uh, next right. Thursday at, I believe, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, our next question is from uh, Tiffany Madison. She asks, uh, what do you say to people that allege Jefferson was one of the original anarchists? <laughs> well, one of the original anarchists. Um, you know, you can find stuff in Jefferson. Like I said before, he's very complex. Look, uh, Albert J. Nock, who called himself an anarchist, he was a Georgist of sorts, too, but but uh, in many ways, you know, a, a, an inspirational libertarian. Uh, if he was a Georgist, I don't think he wanted uh, any kind of, uh, if, he, if, he, if he favored Georgia's single tax, it would have been the very, very lowest level, like the ward level. Jefferson was a hero to, to Nock, and Nock wrote a book called Mr. Jefferson, and he always referred to him as Mr. Jefferson. Uh, uh, so there's a side of Jefferson, if there's a side of Jefferson that could attract Nock that way, then, yeah, he's somebody to uh, look at closely and pay attention to. Whether he uh, would qualify as an anarchist, you know, that's, uh, you know, I guess that's, uh, I wouldn't go there, but I guess there's some, you know, debate to be made. He, he, he might have had some you know, tendencies, but didn't think it was uh, practical. Because let's remember also, and uh, this needs to be mentioned, and if I don't mention it, I, I'm open, opening myself to legitimate criticism. He owned slaves. He owned human beings. Uh, and he worked them hard. When he was in debt, you know, he... He was often in debt. He, uh, it was the slaves who were supposed to get him out of debt in various ways by, by renting them out and, uh, and, uh, and having the women uh, reproduce. And the slave trade by then had ended. And, and so the only way to get new slaves was to have your slaves reproduce. Uh, uh, we can't uh, forget that about him. It's, it's a very uh, dark side. So uh, I've got a question. Who should libertarians look up to among the the founders and among that generation. Are there any good guys? I think the best guys, and again, this is really on a marking on a curve. I mean, they, they weren't generally anarchists and they, they would have accepted much more powerful local and state government that, than any of us in this uh, session uh, would accept, I'm sure. Uh, but I think the, the Northern anti-federalists, were among the best. And the reason I specify the Northern or the people that Wood called the plebeian uh, anti-federalists, uh, and he recently used that term in his book on uh, Empire of Liberty, which is another book uh, I highly recommend. This is Wood's book now, Gordon Wood. Um, he distinguishes the the, the Northern uh, sort of uh, working class anti-federalists with the aristocratic uh, anti-federalists like George Mason and Patrick Henry, they were slave owners. And one reason they feared centralized government was they thought it would end up being used to smash slavery someday. That was not the concern of the northern anti-federalists because they didn't, you know, they were in the north, they uh, were opposed to slavery, they certainly didn't own slaves. And so uh, their fear of centralization, I think, is a more honorable uh, fear. You always have to keep that in mind. I mean, uh, we, we like, I mean, we generally, I generally like that give decentralized uh, power because uh, for no other reason, voting with your feet is cheaper, the smaller the jurisdictions. But for a lot of people, decentralized power means slavery being safe. They're thinking back to the founding era and up to the Civil War, or they think of uh, Jim Crow, you know, being safe because there's no centralized power to strike it down. So people sometimes hear we say things and mean one th mean one thing by it, but other people often hear something else. So we have to be sensitive to that. Uh, it's not a, you know the the the, the mission the message can get garbled in the, in the transmission, and we need to understand uh, what context people are hearing things in it because they may not be getting the meaning that you're intending to convey. I hope that answered it. it was a bit roundabout. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, Jack Ficka asks. I believe I've seen the claim that the Constitution and Declaration of Independence were mere window dressing for intentions which were far different from what they stated. What's your view? Well, I think to a large extent that's true. I, I talked a lot about that in the uh, uh, in the last session a week ago. 
the Declaration, of course, has uh, some good sentiments in it. Uh, Jefferson, it seemed to me, was pretty much lifting uh, a lot of it from John Locke. And there is a famous statement by Jefferson where he said he really didn't think he was saying anything new uh, in, in there. Uh, but there's some there's some things in there too that uh, that that, that uh, uh, I think we, we need to pay more attention to. For instance, I always like the, the line that says, "Governments are instituted among men." <coughs> After he, he talks about the uh, inalienable rights uh, of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, uh, note the word uh, "property" is is missing from there. But I, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion over the years why that's the case and. I'm not really clear on the uh, on the debate there, but uh, but let's look at this uh, sentence. Uh, government governments are instituted among men. Notice the passive there. Uh, it sort of takes human agency out of it. They is, they're just somehow instituted. <coughs> if you look at what happened, how the move was made from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, we see that it wasn't just some vague passive thing that governments are instituted. We had a cabal, you could say, of centralizers, uh, Hamilton, Madison, uh, James Wilson, uh, a whole bunch of them, who um, deliberately set out to, to, uh, to uh, create a strong national government <coughs> because they thought it was not going to be a, a, a great nation capable of greatness without it. I didn't think that was going to be, uh, that was going to be the fate of a simply a loose collection of states. Uh, so I think th I think the Constitution, in a way, was a cover for uh, a somewhat hidden agenda. Although they weren't always so hidden. I mean, Madison, Madison and Wilson go to Philadelphia for the convention, uh, both pointing out that the problem is not too little government. Uh, sorry, the problem is not has not been too much government, but too little government. So they're they're pretty uh, clear about that. But there's there's always you know, like I say, these all these things are always very complicated. Uh, the Federalists, who we tend to dislike because they wanted a big, uh, strong central government, uh, were uh, opposed to a lot of the early expansion because not so much maybe that they were opposed to expansion per se, but they thought expansion in, into the West was going to, uh, uh, those new territories would end up aligning with the South and, and strengthen the slave power. And the, any, the Federalists, um, the Federalists now in New York and, and in New England, did not want to see their own power watered down by that rival power. So they actually took a good position, opposed uh, expansion. So, like I say, these things are very complicated. And, uh, yeah, they don't always say what they mean. You have to look in, uh, you know, between the lines or in, uh, in letters, private letters and things like that. But uh, uh, you always got to look below the surface. But I think any good historian yeah, does, does want to do that. Our next question is from Tiffany Madison. Uh, what do you think the state of our empire would be had the Southern Secession attempt succeed? That's a good question. I haven't thought a whole lot about that. One thing that I think would have happened, and I think uh, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel, who has written a great, an excellent book on the Civil War called um, Emancipating Slaves and Enslaving Free Men, uh, I think he agrees with this, that it probably would have hastened the end of slavery. Uh, and I think even some Confederate uh, Confederate uh, uh, leaders understood that. Uh, I did a paper some years ago about um, abolitionists who opposed uh, the Civil War. Uh, of course, most abolitionists, even even the ones that were Quakers and and by nature pacifists, once the war got started, they didn't oppose the war. They they said, well, let's at least get a good get a good thing out of it, namely freeing of the slaves. So they went along with it. But there were a few Spooner's an example, Alexander Spooner. Is, or were a few who opposed the war, uh, and uh, I think they understood that. Uh, well, they uh, didn't think that cessation, uh, se secession, should be forcibly interfered with. They certainly did not approve of slavery, and they, so they, they they weren't happy that uh, the Confederacy was going to break off to protect the uh, you know the, the institution of slavery, which they regarded as uh, man stealing. Uh, but, but it seemed to me that the people who thought it would hasten the end of slavery were on to something, because what it would have done was cut the length of the Underground Railroad approximately in half, right? Instead of having to get to the, to the uh, uh, Canadian border, a, a, a runaway slave would only have 
to get to the Mason-Dixon line and get into the north where he would find protection. Don't forget, the states before the Civil War were enacting, uh, some of the states in the north were enacting personal liberty laws, which was a way of nullifying the Fugitive Slave Act, the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, which was protected by the Constitution. Right, Returning slave, runaway slaves was constitutional because there's language in there uh, to that effect. And so b laws were passed by the Congress before the secession um, saying that runaway slaves had to be returned. And uh, some northern states were defying that by, per by passing what they called personal uh, uh, liberty laws, which would give uh, slaves standing in court and, and, and be able to resist uh, being sent back. The funny thing is the, the southern states, which are regarded as, as uh, absolutists on, state, on states' rights, opposed the states enacting their own personal liberty laws. They complained to Washington. So it shows you they were hypocrites. They were for so-called states' rights, a, a term I don't like. I don't believe states have rights. But they, were, they favored states' rights until it went against their own interests. Then they were against slave, uh, states' rights. Uh, what would have happened after that? Who knows? Who uh, knows? I, I think it would have been better to have two or more countries rather than rather than the one uh, uh, Leviathan we have, because I think it all of that, the consolidated, uh, uh, you know, uh, continental uh, power, uh, uh, I think aided the cause of empire, and having it break up early would have probably been probably been good in that regard, at least. I think uh, one of the things I found interesting. Uh, I took a civil rights law class uh, in law school, and my professor brought up the fact that in North Carolina, prior to the Civil War, uh, in a lot of places, free blacks were allowed to vote. And then once tensions uh, started rising, uh, that was taken away from them. So in a lot of ways, the situation got a lot more uh, contentious. Our next uh, question is from Kyle Platt. He says, uh, what about Thomas Paine? Tell me something to make me stop liking him. <laughs> I've always been uh, fond of uh, Thomas Paine. I'm not an expert on Thomas Paine. I like, I like the rights of man. He says some great things in there. Uh, one of my favorite lines is, uh, I won't quote it direct uh, verbatim, but I mean, I can't quote it verbatim, but he says, uh, he says you know, uh, he's, he's looking over all the wars in England, uh, you know, before uh, before the period he's writing, and he and he says uh, it's not so much that they uh, they they raised taxes to carry on wars, but they carried on wars so that they could raise taxes. Uh, so he was pretty. Uh, I think he was a very astute observer. Um, I don't know if Han know anything bad about him. He didn't own slaves, right? He lived in Philadelphia, and then he went to France. Uh, so I I I'd have to uh, do do some research. If you want me to find something bad about him, uh, I generally like the guy. Uh, he was pretty close to an anarchist. I mean, he's got that great line in the in Rights of Man also, where he says, I've quoted it many times, where he says, uh, the the great part of the of order in society has nothing to do with the government. It comes out of custom and mutual self interest and you know uh, trade and uh, social cooperation. And these aren't all his words. And he says, if the government were to disappear tomorrow. That order would be largely intact. Now, you know, he wasn't, he didn't claim to be an anarchist. Maybe he really was, and be, but maybe he just couldn't say that in those days. But that comes pretty darn close. Uh, by the way, uh, as far as getting close to anarchism, uh, John Quincy Adams says something very similar. I, I have a post up about this on my blog. Might have been at C4SS also. Uh, a post... Uh, sorry, there's a there's a paragraph in his famous uh, we, uh, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. And if you look up that speech, there's a paragraph where he seems to be saying the same thing that Payne uh, says in the quotation I just uh, gave you, that most of the order in society has nothing to do with the criminal law or the government, but comes out of uh, it's organic, bottom up. Uh, I was pretty surprised when I realized that that's what uh, Adams was saying. Anyway. Sorry, sorry, Kyle. If you still like uh, pain, I can't uh, tell you anything today to disabuse you of that. Yeah, I, I think the only uh, somewhat negative thing I can remember about pain was that he was, uh, and this always seemed to be uh, kind of at odds with the rest of the things he said, but I, I remember that he was an early advocate of public schooling, uh, which... Ah. That's, eh. yeah. 
Uh, well, the other thing that ulcer, the other thing that oh. go ahead, sorry. The only the other thing that the, the left likes about pain, and I think it's Eric Foner who's written about pain. I always get the Foner brothers mixed up. I think it's Eric. Maybe it's Philip. I forget. Uh, but pain somewhere endorses something that sounds like social security. You know, for uh, for the elderly, so they grab on to that. But there are other places. There's another quote from his somewhere. I've seen it, but I'm not sure where it appears. Where he says that um, in unequal incomes is not per se a, an evil thing or the result of some evil thing. So he acknowledges that you know pe people are different, and the, you know there's going to tend there will tend to be different incomes. Uh, so I throw that in there. Our, our next question is from BK Marcus, and uh, I think this was in um, uh, in Conceived in Liberty, and I think I see uh, first edition Conceived in Liberty right behind your head there. Uh, yes. But uh, <laughs> Rothbard says that the American revolutionaries were divided into a coastal educated mercantilist class and a frontier illiterate libertarian class. Does that sound right? Uh. That sounds roughly right. I mean, obviously, something like that's going to be an oversimplification. That seems consistent. I mean, I do, I knew, I knew no Rothbard writes that. Uh, that seems uh, fairly in harmony with with uh, with Gordon Wood's views in uh, his his book, um, the radicalism radicalism of the uh, American Revolution. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't want to push it too far because I think there was support generally for expansion, which means the army and the government moving uh, it to the west, clearing the land, making, letting it, you know, getting the Indians off it. So uh, let's not. I don't want to be too uh, uh, Pollyannish about uh, that group. They certainly probably didn't want to be bothered too much by the government in their own business and and uh, you know concerns. So that's. That's uh, true, but um, like I say, as far as expansion goes and clearing the Indians, and and uh, I don't think they were against uh, internal improvements necessarily, uh, roads or uh, canals. So I wouldn't want to push that too far and, and say you know make them out to be Rothbardians in some sense. Probably that probably was not true. Well, if they wanted roads, they certainly weren't anarchists. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I'll put out a last call for questions here and uh, let people know about some of the stuff we've got going on here this week at Liberty Me U. Uh, we've got kind of a light week this week. Week The only session we have for the rest of the week is Thursday night with Isaac Morehouse. He's going to be talking about his new Liberty Guide, which is available for members called Rethinking Higher Education. Uh, but next week, we've got, uh, we've got eight sessions next week, starting with Jeff Tucker on Sunday, uh, we've got Bitcoin-related stuff on Monday, uh, Friday, and Saturday. And then uh, I think next Tuesday is going to be really interesting. At 10 a.m., we've got uh, Gary Chartier. He's going to talk about left libertarianism. And then at 9 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday night, uh, Peter Earle is going to be talking about uh, his book, A Century of Anarchy. We've also got Jason Brennan on Wednesday night and Thaddeus Russell on Thursday night. So it's going to be a really interesting week, and I hope to see you all back here at Liberty Me U. Um, and people uh, took us up on the last call for questions. So uh, BK Marcus asks, Tom Woods argues that the American revolutionaries were conservatives, trying to conserve the rights of Englishmen. Does that sound right? Well, I said something similar to that. I mean, they certainly uh, were coming out of the context uh, of, uh, of, the, of the English uh, uh, system. Uh, and their original complaint was that they, they were being, being denied, right, the rights of Englishmen. Don't forget they complained about taxation without representation. So they weren't opposed to taxation. And it must have seen as natural as, uh, as anything, right, and uh, does to most people today. Uh, but they had no say in it, right? They didn't have representation in the in the parliament. Uh, so if they, you know, if the the rights of Englishmen had been extended to them uh, at that time, they might well have. Uh, that might have been the end of it. They might have stayed in the uh, the empire, uh, and uh, who knows? Broken off later on, I suppose. But um, I don't know that that makes them conservatives because uh, you know if you read Wood's book, uh, uh, not Tom Wood's book, if you read um, uh, Gordon Wood's book, uh, 
the radicalism, radicalism of the American Revolution. Uh, he makes, a, I think, a very uh, impressive case that there was there was something radical about this, and there, it was an attempt to overthrow aristocracy, and 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 uh, and for a while it was successful in the various uh, states because, Arist as I spoke about last week, these aristocracies did build up during the colonial period. There were you know local elites which had their power from the crown, but then had their own little bailiwicks and and turfs which they were very reluctant to give up, and that. That was the internal revolution that Merrill Jensen refers to. There was an external revolution against the British and the internal ones against these, uh, these state aristocracies. So I would not say it was a conservative uh, revolution. I would agree with, uh, with Gordon Wood. It's good. We have, an, we have a debate here between Wood and Woods, don't we? Tom Woods and, Gilbert, and uh, Gordon Wood. Uh, and uh, both BK and I just uh, linked to the radicalism of the American Revolution uh, on Amazon in chat there. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out there. Tiffany Madison has our last question of the night. Uh, she says, last question, I promise. Any books to recommend for a recovering constitution? Ah, well, I would read Our Enemy, the State by Albert J. Nock. That's where I first encountered uh, dissenting uh, views on the Constitutional Convention and everything sort of building up to it. Nock was heavily influ influenced by Charles Beard, who wrote a book called The Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, which a book that has been criticized over the years. I'm not saying that book was made no mistakes, but he tried to argue that, that uh, many of the men who gathered at uh, Philadelphia had a uh, economic interest at work. They had, uh, they were, they were, uh, the federal the the government there was no federal government yet but the government was was in debt to them because of the uh, revolution and there had been land speculation there were lots of land speculation among the uh, the founding fathers they were deep into land spec speculation uh, in, in other words where they got land grants from uh, and and then uh, wanted the government to go out and build up the area so they could then sell the land at a great uh, profit um, so I would start with knock I'd have to think of some others. Uh, uh, Rothbard's series, I guess, doesn't go that far. His, his number four in his series does talk about the Articles of Confederation. Uh, who else has written about the Constitution? I, I will have to uh, think about that and get back to you all. Sorry, I can't. All right, well, come up thank you so much. It's been excellent as usual. Uh, we're looking forward to having you back uh, in September. We're, for those of you who weren't here earlier, we're going to be having a, a monthly. Uh, webinar uh, uh, sponsored by the Future of Freedom Foundation, uh, probably usually with Sheldon, and I'm really excited about that. We're going to start that in September, probably about the third week, so definitely check that out and check out Sheldon on Liberty Me and at the Future of Freedom Foundation, and uh, we hope to see you back again soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks.